um, uh, the in most interesting scenario can usually be expressed in a what if question. And I feel wow. like a lot of your music is like that. Wow. You know, um, a lot of your music is like, what if I do, at least it sounds to me like that, <laughs> you know, you're going like, what if I do this? Because um, a lot of what you're doing is has not been done before and this is why it's so so inspiring to to check it out oh, wow. because it, i feel like wow i never heard that before yeah i mean i like to i like to be i like to have the feeling that i'm that i'm pushing it somewhere that i've never been before yeah you know um and and yet yeah, to be to take risks you know and to be audacious and to to choose the thing that's like too much mm -hmm. you know i like i like that yeah <laughs> how did you how did you uh Uh, first experience that process like uh, going a little bit too too far because I, I know the feeling from myself when when you go somewhere and you kind of get hooked on that feeling like mm. oh, I, that mm. feels nice mm. you know yeah I don't I don't know where exactly that came from maybe um like starting to be a song a song you know a songwriter in without much of a scene you know scene around me I just grew up in a random pretty rural town and mm. My brother was really inspiring to me as a as a kind of like budding songwriter and everything, and I was kind of imitating him. But beyond him, there wasn't like a larger community. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't go to shows, uh, like you know, that kind of thing. When I was a teenager, you know, um, it wasn't available to me. I didn't I didn't know about it, um, and there just wasn't much going on in like central Connecticut mm -hmm. where I was growing up. Um, And in a lot of ways, I like miss, I feel like I missed something in not having that, you know, friends who come from like other cities or, or small cities that had like scenes in their town and mm -hmm. artists coming through and everything. I'm envious of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe it allowed me to just kind of like make my own rules or mm -hmm. or just uh make make things without really regard to um or reference to like what a what a normal way of doing things would be mm -hmm. what was your you know formal training of, of the guitar or music what was it mm. i never really studied the guitar but and it's funny like you know when i was really young and just kind of getting into music um I was, you know, I was, I was really inspired by like punk mm -hmm. music and just the ethos of like doing it quickly and the idea that, um, you know, um, vir you know, virtuosity or technique mm -hmm. were, uh, were antagonistic to truth yeah. in expression. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't really have a lot of patience for... Um, you know, learning things to learning to do things the right way, or something. But at the same time, I was just very curious about about music. How did they do that? You know, or like even with four track stuff, like mm -hmm. um, you know the the early Beatles, like all that stuff is on four track. You know, mm -hmm. and I would be reading about this, and I'd be like, well, I have a Tascam 424, mm -hmm. so I should be able to do you know Rubber Soul. Sure, on this yeah. thing, you know, and so I just got very curious about like how do how do they do you know how what are those sounds how do they do them, recording wise and orchestration wise and all that stuff. So, I guess despite my you know um, you know ideology, my my curiosity about music won out, and I just kept on kind of like I guess studying things and. Um, so did you take them off the record? and you know learned the parts and that way you learn to 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 pl actually play the instrument well i don't know how to play the, i don't know how, <laughs> well, i don't know how to play the sounds, instrument it sounds like you can play the instrument you know i play it my own way you know yeah. i hack through it but like that's like that's like anything um but i did i eventually studied like orchestration okay um yeah. you know because I, i really wanted to know how to you know how to write for for orchestra you know mm. so i studied that okay so um Also, when you incorporate so many different influences, also the, the African thing, you know, it seems to me the the kora has been an influence on you. Oh, the kora, yeah, 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 yeah. How it's played, and mm. you really transport that on the guitar mm. for your songs. Yeah, like what you know, there's so much invention in in 
in African guitar playing, West African yeah. guitar playing, and um, and I love that stuff. I love how melodic it is, and I love the freedom of, of um, just very staccato and and uh, you know ripping and in major keys, yeah, you know, beautiful. and doing a lot of inversions and, but with just relatively major minor sort of chord, I don't know, yeah. 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 Cool. I, d I don't, yeah, I didn't think, really think about it as, you know, transposing the chora to the guitar, but in a, w in a way, maybe that feeling of uh, West African guitar music comes from the Kora tradition, which is, you know, hundreds of years old. Yeah. Um, you know, those instrumentalists bringing Kora fingerings and whatnot to, to, uh, to guitar music. Mm. I'm curious sometimes when, with, with your songs, uh, how you start the process, mm. you know, because when I think of a song like The, the Socialize, yeah, yeah. Um, I have the feeling the guitar pattern was there first, and then the... What? Actually, that's a question. Was the guitar uh, pattern I, there first, and then the beat, which is another thing that I'm so impressed by. Sometimes the the beats uh, seem to be like when you hear it, it fits perfectly, but mm -hmm. also it poses like a question because it's mm -hmm. not the first thing you would think mm -hmm, somebody mm -hmm. would play to that guitar pattern. Mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. So I wonder what comes first, and then how you approach. Um, Like, for instance, when you start with the guitar pattern, yeah, yeah. you know, how do you go about... I think the earlier version, like, there was a demo version of the Socialites that was, um, that I think didn't have that arpeggiated guitar thing. I think that, I think that came later, but I, I actually don't remember with that song. I like the idea of, of the, the, the beat posing a question. I think that's cool. <laughs> yeah, this is how it sounds to me. When you, when you start with the beat uh, for, for a song with yeah. the guitar, uh -huh. how, how do you go about it? Generally, I just um, have, you know, little samples or um, little pieces of sound that I like. Um, And I arrange them in the in the edit window of Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just kind of like you know, lay them lay lay out a couple different layers, and then you know, and for things like the Getty address or or um, you know things of when I was younger, really really kind of early in doing this, um, that would be that. The Getty address. Where did you record the the woodwinds and everything? Uh, at school, I was in college at the time, man. and uh, so many great songs on that record. Yeah, thanks, it, man. thanks, man. Yeah, you could start like a um, like an extracurricular club at university, and you could, if you filled out forms and wrote a little essay or something, you could apply for funding for your mm. club. And so I started a club that was called the Orchestral Society for the Preservation of the Orchestra. And um, and so I got you know grant money to to record um, you know put together a a group of players you know and record them and uh, and so yeah like some of those it's like a this weird little stone chapel mm -hmm. um, at at Yale um, is where the woodwinds were recorded and maybe the strings as well or maybe the strings were multi tracked and just done in like a rec room. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But, uh, oh yeah, so re more recently, I guess, um, you know, I have that kind of like rhythmic grid. Um, and then um, I actually get people to play it. Mm -hmm. You know, like Mike yeah. will we'll learn, ask, you know, generally if there is something that approximates a kick, snare, and hat, that'll go to Mike. And then you know, other other elements that seem like auxiliary or hand percussion or whatever. Um, on the last two records, Mauro Rafosco did those, mm -hmm. who's um, just an amazing Brazilian percussionist um, who I got to know through David Byrne. And uh, and he's just an absolute monster. Um, and uh, and it, yeah, it was, it was really fun to to do that, to go in and take these beats. Oh, uh, so then we, you know, we'd record them, and um, some, you know, then you have the freedom to decide like um, how you want to treat it from yeah. there. And there's like so many, there's such a world of things there. Do you leave it as performed? Mm. You know, do you find a small segment of it that you like as a loop, and just 
treat it like that, or do you actually, you know, cut on the on the transient and reproduce the exact, oftentimes sort of like weird feel mm. of the original kind of like, you know, demo beat. Um, and different times, it seems like different, um, you know, different things are appropriate at different times, or like sound good at different times. Um, so yeah, it's a, you know, just trial and error, following your gut, or you know. But I do feel when you play live, you encourage the the band members also to sort of treat it spontaneously, also, right? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think Mike has a sort of also like it, like a jazz attitude at times. He does. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder um, where did you where did you find him? Because there was another drummer before that, mm -hmm. right? Who played on Bitter Orca, right? Mm -hmm. Brian, Brian, okay. Brian is a is an amazing drummer. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mike was playing in various bands around around Brooklyn. He played in a band called Glass Ghost, that is pretty awesome. Mm -hmm. And um, and yeah, I just loved his his feel. Yeah. His sensitivity. He seemed like a drummer, who, is like, you know responding to melody mm -hmm. which is i feel like a somewhat rare rare thing as a drummer i think that if i were a drummer i would be inclined to think structurally you mm -hmm. know what i mean and so mike is like a poet you know yeah so i love that about him yeah yeah how he plays maybe that was it that's pretty special i yeah, think yeah man oh wow okay yeah we should bring that in we're doing some um it, we're not playing it right now yeah Uh, but we're doing some like residency shows in America in the mm -hmm. fall where we're going to do like different sets every night. Mm. And so it would be fun to bring that one in. Man, uh, I love that song. Thank so you. Thank you. Special one. Thanks. Mm. All of them are great. Um, a lot of your music really forces the listener to listen. It's not like I'm just going to put that on and then, you know, do something else. Maybe I'll be do something else, but constantly your music will be like, what? What was that? Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, yeah. even when I listen to it hundreds of times, like I can go back to uh, maybe that was it, and still get a kick out of it. Like, how did you come up with that pattern against the, you know the time? Right. It took me a really I transcribed that song, and it took me a really long time to figure out oh, what the actual time feel below that is. Right, know? right. And also, I only got the sense of that in the last four bars that really gave it away. Mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, that was that was weird. That was a weird one. Maybe that was it. Uh, started out as just like a little like voice memo, mm -hmm. um, just like acoustic guitar and that melody, and then um, it was just it was more just intuitive, figuring out where you know where the kick and snare would go on it. You know, yeah. so I don't. Yeah, I probably don't know what the what the time is on it. But do you write it down? Mm, only if I'm writing a, an arrangement for um, for like players that need to read, like horn players or string quartet. So the band, you're just teaching them the songs through playing them for it. Mm -hmm. Do you send out mm -hmm. recordings or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, yeah. That's the way we've done it. Recent this in this last round, it okay. goes a lot faster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so then what's the process? Everybody just prepares the music and then you get together and you're like, uh, I like what you play and I don't like what you play. Maybe you can do something different. Or yeah, I mean, you know, we, so we put together Lamplit Pros from, from just the, the multi-tracks. And so, yeah, in, you know, in the past, rehearsal has taken so much time mm. because till teaching these kind of like you know parts some of which get a little tricky i guess um in person mm. you know t can take forever and then i can be kind of an unreliable narrator um about about things as well um so to have the you know the concrete resource of the recording and just it allows people you know space i think to to get in there and and uh and just learn it in their own way at mm. their own pace and then so rehearsals were like, I think they were pretty, pretty straightforward, you know, coming into a situation where everybody, know, you know, knows their part. And then from there, it's just about blending and, um, and tones and figuring out how to listen for each other. Cool. Uh, when, I, when I see you guys live, I mean, that's the first time I see you, I'll see you guys live, but I've seen a lot of videos in all, all the records. 
um, it really seems to me like you're a very democratic uh, band leader. Uh, and I sometimes get the sense, it reminds me a little bit of Sly and the Family Stone. Ah. You know, that, that mastermind in the back, uh, not always in the back, but you know, that mastermind writing all these beautiful songs, mm -hmm. but then going like, you know, I'll, I'll lay this one out, you know, as from the vocal point. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll sing that one. And then you, you're really using everybody's full potential, I think. That's cool. That's cool. I like the way you're. I like the way you're describing that. <laughs> and I love. I love Sly so much. It's funny you say that because I've been listening to "There's a Riot Going On" mm -hmm. like so much in the last year or so. Yeah. And yeah, just passages where um, uh, that's all I'm listening to. Yeah. Yeah, and it's such a deep, crazy record. And then those earlier kind of like singles that are just so stand. Like yeah, stand. yeah, just so major key, so exuberant. Mm. It's unbelievable, the emotion of those recordings. Yeah. What else inspires you these, these days? What do you listen to? Um, on this tour, I've been listening to um, a lot of, like, Robert Johnson, actually. Robert Johnson. Just the Robert classic, Johnson. like, Delta Blues mm -hmm. player, you know? Um, and, you know, I think there are maybe, like, I don't know, 27 recording songs that he recorded mm. so there's it's very limited but um i don't know why i've gone back to that i started listening to it when we were in japan mm. and then I, i i like to go through periods where you're just like i listen to one thing and i listen to it like Me too. over yeah. and over and over again yeah. i've also been listening to that song cruising by uh smoky robinson mm -hmm. so much okay it's such a beautiful song it's hard to say what my favorite Uh, record of yours is, but I think the one I've listened to the most is the one with Björk. Oh, uh, really? Mount Witt Wittenberg Orca. Oh, cool. Uh, I just can't get enough of that record, and um, I, I want to know, I want to know everything about it. How you, how you started it, how, how the process for that record was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How you met Björk and how she was in in the studio or whatever. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, okay, well, okay. So hopefully I'll get the years right. I think in 2010. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine, Brandon Stosi, uh, in in New York, where I lived at the time, uh, was on the board of a um, of like a bookstore in New York. That um, well, it's called Housing Works, and so it's like a, a charity bookstore for um, and all the money that it generates goes to like AIDS research. Mm. And I think once a year, maybe twice a year, they do these things, with just sort of like shows, you know, benefits to, to raise money. And, uh, and he's like involved in music as well. Um, he runs that website, The Creative Independent. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've checked it out. I, I think I've heard the name. Maybe I've read something there. It's cool. It's, it's kind of like artists talking to artists about, mm. you know, their, their practice and stuff. But, um... So he and he, I think, worked on a on a monograph or something with with Matthew Barney, and got to know Bjork through that. So he had the idea of putting us together, and uh, and he was kind of like, you know, it can be whatever you guys want to do. If you want to um, play some of your own songs and then she'll play some of hers, that's cool. Or if you want to do something collaborative, that'd be cool too. And uh, I had um, was it 2010. Maybe it was 2009. I don't know exactly. But I don't it know. Sounds like the right period. Yeah, but anyway, um, it's funny that all that stuff is long enough ago that you're like, wait, what? You're <laughs> oh well. Um, but uh, but my idea was like, I want to just make make a, a suite of songs, like new songs, and we'll just get it together. And the thing is that it was coming up really quickly. Like there was. Um, maybe uh you know a, a week or two um to write it and then we would have a week to rehearse it and then it was the show so the whole thing was the whole timeline was like two or three weeks it was crazy mm. wow. um and so i just wrote it as quickly as i could first thought best thought like punk style um and made you know little multi-track demos um out in California, because we were between tours, I think, and we were just resting um, at my aunt's house. Mm. <laughs> um, and uh, 
And so then we came back and learned the stuff really quickly. Bjork joined us, I think, for the last two days of rehearsing it. Um, and that was just so incredible. The, the, to be right in the room with her, you know, just in our little living room in, in Brooklyn, as she was, you know, her, her voice is like magical. It's, it's, in, yeah. it's insane. Otherworldly. It was so powerful and yeah. so inspiring for, for us. So how did she learn your songs? I don't remember. I guess she must have had the demos as well. Okay. Yeah. 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 Does she make music? Yeah. music? Mm, I don't really think so. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I think she's kind of like me, where she could write it down if she's writing a part. Mm -hmm. But I don't. I don't. I'm not a good like sight reader or reader yes. in general. I think she's the same way. I think she must have listened to it. You know, I was I sang demos of her of her parts. Mm -hmm. um, What was it like to to rehearse her? Like to say to her how she maybe should approach things. it was awesome I mean basically it was crazy because for the most part for like 99% of it it so it just sounded perfect and kind of like I hoped it would you mm -hmm. know and then there were a couple things where um, you know it was just like oh like could you pronounce this um, you know vowel differently or something yeah. you know like little things like that but and then she was so just selfless as a collaborator I I, I couldn't believe that how she was just sort of like I am you know here for this for this collaboration to serve these songs and and uh, that was that was so neat uh, yeah so she's pretty pretty amazing mm -hmm. person so we recorded oh yeah so then we had the show and I think the show is on YouTube right it is it is yeah, yeah. the show was really really fun um, and Yeah, we. I think we came away feeling like we pulled it off, but we maybe could have used a bit more rehearsal. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I think we did a whole lot more touring um, for like a bit of Orca, and we got around to recording it, you know, several months later. Mm -hmm. um, and so it came, you know, it came, but we did that at the Rare Book Room, basically live, you know, in the spirit of... Um, of uh just the sort of spontaneity and minimalism of the of the project um recorded it at the rare book room and um and yeah um the last song all we are bjork i think maybe was playing some shows so she she came in after we had put down the the tracks to um to sing her parts and uh and yeah just the feeling in the room as she did uh her her verse on that was just Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, very powerful, and I think that it was the first or the second take, yeah, for her, yeah, which is like, what is that? Yeah, what is that? Yeah, yeah, wow. So when you when you compose, like, oh, you know, you have you have one week of composing. Maybe you can go a little bit further in explaining, like, uh, first uh -huh. thought, best thought. I like that concept. Oh yeah, I think that that I think Arthur Russell said that. Mm -hmm. Or he had something named that. Yeah, first thought, best thought. Um, that's kind of that punk idea of like, you know, don't belabor it, don't, you know, don't uh, second guess it, don't uh, prepare even, just yeah. go. It's very spontaneous that way. Then. Yeah. Like improvisational in a way also. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, I know. I mean, I think it's a useful um, thing for me to remember when I can because I do tend to get a little bit heady about stuff sometimes. So It doesn't sound like that. <laughs> oh, cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I like that idea. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about The Bride? Just anything that, that uh, you have to think of when you maybe go back, listen to that song, or if you yeah. still play it, I don't know. We haven't played it in a bit. Um, it, would be, it would be fun to play. It was a melody that I wrote... Um, like a couple years before we recorded it and um i had it kicking around i always sort of liked the melody just how kind of wild it is mm -hmm. um and how it seems to you know there's like a grammar of melodies and i just and almost like a you know a sentence structure or something and uh just the particular grammar of that melody the way it sort of like leads inexorably to The uh, da na 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 na. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I liked it, um, but uh, I think I rewrote the words for for Bitta Orca. 
Um, and I think there is a YouTube of like a really early mm -hmm. version of the song with different lyrics. With different lyrics, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, How come you you wanted to change it? I don't remember. Um, and somebody pointed me to that YouTube, and they were like, "This is the bride," and it's it's from. It's it's early in in Dirty Projectors. It's like New Attitude era, like first some first live shows, and I had ah. forgotten all about it. In some ways, it's difficult for me. I mean, I guess you know it was it was a while, it was a long time ago, but it's hard to remember. Mm -hmm. You know what I was thinking, but I guess I maybe I just felt that the lyrics weren't. Um, I actually have no idea. Yeah, I I decided to rewrite the lyrics. Yeah. So there's different words on the the Oracle version. Mm. Do you have something like a daily routine, or like, do you practice, or is it more a process of just maybe uh, relearning a song that you want to play again, or uh, composing, and then you pose a, like a question or like a like a goal or uh, a problem, musical problem, onto yourself, and then mm. you kind of solve it by mm -hmm. trying to play. Or mm -hmm. what's your? Process? I don't. Well, you know, daily routine is difficult. Is difficult to say right now because I'm on tour sure, yeah. you know um, but I think you know in the larger kind of like cycle of like writing and recording and touring touring is, is always like sort of um, uh, it's a good place to collect questions and um, collect um, yeah interests or like I want to, I want to, I want to check that out, or I would love to try this, you know, and yeah, I mean, I think that writing, I like to do, the way I like to write is just to go somewhere and like be alone or basically alone and work const constantly and just sort of be in my own head and just generate as much um, as possible uh, and not really edit very much yeah and then editing is a part of arranging and recording mm. you know yeah what do you do to um, if you feel uninspired but you feel like you want to you want to do something how how do you get the engine running like the creative yeah. spark yeah yeah I think it's important because when you can't work for whatever reason I think you should just pay you have to pay attention to that you know mm. I trust that it's that there's a there's a cycle to it, you know. There's an ebb and a flow. Mm. There's you know the uh, whatever a, a um, you know it's like sleep or something. You're awake and then you sleep. You contract the muscle and then you relax it. So if you're not in the mood to do something, you shouldn't. <laughs> you know. Right. Okay. But how do, does that translate when you have to do a you know write a couple of songs in into? Well, you give yourself weird weird deadlines like yeah. that. I do. I do a lot of that. A lot of my deadlines are like aspirational. I you know, see. where I'm like, oh, I'm going to be done with this two weeks from now. Yeah. And maybe you hit it. Maybe you don't. Mm, I see. We touched on that a little bit before, but um, I feel like your world is constantly growing, and you're adding so much new stuff to your to your palette that you're choosing from. Mm. Do you think that's connected to your curiosity to? Uh, say like, well, that, I've done it that way, but now I'm going to do it differently, or now I'm going to add something. Yeah, yeah, I think so. It's not. Um, I, I guess those things, the the things that get added and the things that fall away, it, it happens, you know, pretty pretty intuitively. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'll either just forget how I did it before, mm. <laughs> or just be like, okay, well, that that got boring, so let's try it. Let's try to do this differently now yeah yeah i think the the new record also combines a lot of stuff from the past with new thoughts also would you say the same or i would say the same yeah yeah and i think that people have asked me about this before so i've had a chance to think about it <laughs> um but uh and i think that like part of that had to do with not playing shows on the self-titled record right and so to just finish an album and master it and take a couple weeks and then go right back into writing more yeah. and recording more. I didn't have, you know, 
if you if you know you because you you I always end up killing myself making making a record, and it, you know it's just it's so it's it can be very intense and everything. And then oftentimes when you finish a record, then you go out on tour for like a year, and that's its own form of just you know intensity. Sometimes when you when you're you know when you're done with all that, you're just sort of like, all right, whatever, however the, the, however I made those decisions and whatever kind of like stylistic choices I ended up here, I'm going to do the exact opposite this yeah. time, you know? But because I didn't go on tour, I had no, I had, had no angst about it. And I yeah. wasn't like, I need to start again. I need to throw everything away. And so it just allowed me to kind of build on the things that I, that I know, mm -hmm. you know? So... It it ended up being I think it's maybe yeah it's a, it's a record that is more taking yeah taking the various um, like things that I love and and uh, and you know I don't know elements of a style or something and then throwing them all together. What's going on in I want to feel it all? What do you mean? <laughs> that's a, that's a journey that track. I mean yeah yeah. I love that you're allowing. Um, yourself to take that many risks and also to have a song not be one thing you mm. know mm. it's something that I think I've learned from you um, through listening to you like allowing a song or a composition to start out as something but then becoming something totally different huh. without having to return always uh -huh. to, the, to its core idea you know oh, just to yeah. be like well that that's somehow connected uh -huh. and it comes through me Uh -huh. You know, that's what connects it. Okay. And then, now yeah, something yeah. different, but it's still one song, like Ascent uh, Through the Clouds also. Mm. Like, it's a, that's a journey. You Ascent know? Through Clouds, yeah, that song is crazy. But, <laughs> feel it all. To me, that's like a relatively, um, you know, a standard, a, a, a standard sort of song. It's like, um, structurally, it's exactly the same as Impregnable Question. Mm. You know what I mean? Um There's like two verses and then a break, an instrumental break, and then another mm. verse, and then the and even the, the the way that the verse resolves in that kind of like phrase. I guess Gershwin called it a vest, like when the when you know a hard rain's gonna fall. Like the name of the song mm -hmm. is the is the um, kind of like uh, titular or yeah the titular phrase is the last phrase of the melody. I see. And depending on where the the words have gone. It always ends up there, mm. or regardless of where the, the the words in the verse take you, you end up there. Mm. It's just that kind of you know, it's that kind of song. The crazy thing about "Feel It All" is realizing that it could change keys. Yeah. Um, and and so build like tucking those two key changes in there, a lot. I feel like gave it this kind of like constantly like rotating movement. Mm -hmm. And so the song does end in a different place than it began, even though the structure is very, you know, classic. Yeah. Um, yeah, and to me, it, 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 I guess that it works with the subject of the song, too, which is just about experience, mm. you know, time. But, uh, like, on a nerd note, to record the... Um, we recorded all of the... <laughs> We recorded all of the uh, strings and the um, brass in the same key, mm. and then. Um, How about the recorder? Yeah, it was all in the original okay. key, and then um, so the middle section of the song, including the like second verse and the and the bridge, are in the original key of the song, and the first part of the song is pitched down a step, and then the third verse to the end is pitched up a step, and so what that like what that allowed to happen was that the 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 brass uh and winds in the first part of the song are like varus bed down they're a little bit more like narcotized or something mm -hmm. they're just slower and a little bit woozier yeah and then the strings in the last verse and the tremolo the tremolo is that much more like you know pseudoephedrine style you know mm -hmm. um so and yeah so these these instrument groups became even more like what they were in the process of of affecting those key changes to the to the you know to the um recording so i don't know i was really excited about that yeah <laughs> that's cool uh Oh
the street. Room. 